Hello. Hello. Oh, can you, can finally. You? <laughs> finally, we see, we see each other. Yes. Uh, I have to tell you, so I'm Elena Balsamo, and you are? I'm Sonia Bilosetakovic. Mm. So I must tell you one thing first, namely that my first language is not English, it's not even French. Uh, it's Russian because I'm born in Moscow and um, so my English is now, and I live in France, so my English is now, uh, it is like climbing an old bicycle which is uh, rusty and uh, uh, quite hopeless. So I would like you to demand your permission to do like my father did. And my father did the following thing. He was a... Um, uh, he is a scientist and uh, a, a well-known specialist in um, uh, neurophysiology. And as a Soviet citizen who was not allowed to travel, he never went abroad and uh, was just a name for everybody. And then when he came to the West and was invited to all kinds of meetings and conferences, he discovered that his uh, English was still worse than mine. So what he used to do, he had a little paper with him, and from time to time, when he saw that he couldn't follow, he would show this. Speak slower. So if I feel that uh, everything is a catastrophe, I will show you. Think, speak slower. OK, I will do that. Thank you for the information, Ileana. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, who are you? So, I am an American. I'm a writer and a professor. Um, I teach in upstate New York, so not in the city, but several hours away from the city. I teach creative writing and mostly the genre of nonfiction. That's what I focus on. Um, and my uh, my first book came out last year. It's called On Our Way Home from the Revolution. And it's about the 2014 Maidan Revolution in Kiev. Um, mm -hmm. And it also, it's also about my family and my family's sort of history during the Nazi occupation of Ukraine and their journey to America. So it kind of starts in 2014 and then goes back in time and sort of brings it back to the present. Um, so that's the, that's the sort of material I'm interested in, sort of political violence and things and protest and how people operate in oppressive systems. So, yeah, yes, then we have uh, some common interests. Anyway, do you have a book that, uh, with you to show me? Sure, I can show you. Yeah, I have. So my, my, I'm sitting at the kitchen table right now, which is also now my office. So I have all of my books on this table as well. But uh, yeah, this is what it looks like. Mm, on our way home from the revolution. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. <laughs> what do you do, Eliana? Uh, what do I do? Um, I do strange things because when in Russia I graduated from uh, uh, Moscow State University with uh, Scandinavian uh, languages and literatures the subject, and um, when I settled in France, I got my PhD in the same uh, topic, Scandinavian language and literature. And so since that, for quite a long uh, time, I've been doing the same thing, that is to say, uh, writing and translating. That's wonderful. And, uh, uh, so that, um, uh, because there are basically two things that I'm interested in, in to, one is literary history because it was it is close to history and when you come from a country like russia you cannot be indifferent to this and translating comes from the fact that uh, uh, i discovered that uh, in france i couldn't discuss books that i like with natives with frenchmen because they don't exist, so what should I do? So I tried translate, started translating, and have been doing it. But since uh, you cannot translate all the books you like, there—that's where the literary criticism comes in. 
and I do quite a lot because if you cannot translate a book, you can talk about it and tell people about it and perhaps somebody else would translate it. So these are the three things uh, which, uh, which I do. That's amazing. Uh, where are you based exactly right now? Now, uh, I'm exactly based in Chartres, which is, uh, um, yes, uh, 80 kilometers from Paris. And uh, it's a place where I hardly know anybody uh, but for the bookshop owner here. And uh, so for me, nothing has changed. So all the communication go via S S Skype and telephone and everything. And for you, how, where, where are you? So you're in, in the kitchen, but... <laughs> um, actually, it's pretty similar to your situation. My husband and I, uh, just back in August, moved to upstate New York. And we live in a rural area. So, and we don't really know that many people here. So we were already pretty isolated before COVID pandemic started. So um, in some ways, not that much has changed for our daily life. Uh, except going to the grocery store is a much more challenging now, but, um, but yeah, we are in a similar situation, it sounds like. Yes, but how do you do to teach now? Is it uh, video? <clears throat> yeah, it's all, all online. So using okay. Zoom quite a bit, but also um, at my university, many of my students uh, come from New York City. So they were back home with their families dealing with like really extreme circumstances due to the yes. pandemic. So in some cases, you know, um, students have, we had to find alternate ways for students to be able to participate and continue their education, even in the midst of like really, really difficult circumstances. So, um, so there was also just a lot of emailing and using Google Docs and um, other different sort of online resources. How many students do you have? Uh, no. um, so the semester's over, it ended a few weeks ago, but I had um, about 50 students. Um, now that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So, how, often do, how often do you meet? Um, it was, uh, spur I guess you could say it was sporadic. Uh, we were sort of meeting, with one of my classes I met maybe only three times over Zoom. Um, and with mm -hmm. another class, we did primarily what they call asynchronous learning. So where they weren't required to meet all at the same time, but everything was online and we were using discussion boards for the students to interact with each other. Um, all of which is very new to me. I haven't taught online before. So I'm learning, I was learning right in the middle of doing it. I'm still, I mean, I'm still learning. It's really an art, I think, to be able to use the benefits of, of the online platform and have learning occur in that context. Um, oh, sure. And then one learns even from one's own students uh, sometimes. It's uh, a little bit like what I do since many years. Uh, it's not creative writing, but it's uh, cre creative translating. That is to say, I have a translation seminar in Paris which is an open thing. And uh, so some people have been there for 10 years and 12 years and others are coming and some people are going, but we, we keep going on. And it's extremely interesting because uh, uh, the idea from the beginning was to somehow share experience in translating uh, from, uh, so from Swedish into French. We will not touch this very sensible point uh, whether one should, can, uh, allowed to translate from one foreign language to another. But let's, <laughs> let's leave it there. But uh, um, uh, with time going on, I discovered that what I thought was just for me sharing this experience became for me learning from people who are individuals who uh, some of them I know since years now and lots of other things uh, happen when uh, in, during this exchange. Which So can you tell me a little bit more about all of the language you translate from and to? 
because it sounds like you must be a polyglot. You must know like five languages or six or so. Yes, but Scandinavian languages are quite, uh, quite similar to each other. So if you know one, then you know the rest of them. Uh, but at the same time, when I'm speaking to a Norwegian, then I speak Swedish and he or she answers in Norwegian and it's okay. And I won't, uh, would never dare to imitate this uh, Danish horrible uh, way of saying things. The Swedes say that the Danish talk Swedish with a uh, hot potato in their mouth. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I agree. But... Um, Yes, so the languages, it's, it's an interesting thing and which allows to, yes, so both to see how different people can think and imagine the same thing in different languages. Absolutely. I think, I mean, I think uh, tra translators are like my absolute number one heroes. I, I'm, I, I'm so excited to be speaking with you because I, love translation. I mean, I don't really do it very much myself. I've just dabbled a tiny bit from did some Ukrainian to English translating, but uh, I, I think it's, I mean, it's just completely fascinating. I love all the theory behind it. Um, I would love to hear more about sort of how you approach your work. Like, like you mentioned sort of jokingly, let's not even talk about if it's possible, but how do, how do, how do you justify it? I think it's really fascinating. Well, I, I was interested in translation from the very beginning, though I never imagined it as a career. Uh, I simply uh, liked learning languages and I liked translating just to see what comes out of it. What comes out of a Georgian po uh, poem translated into English? Well, something horrible in my case, but still. And um, uh, then uh, uh, what happens is that translation is an interesting mixture of art and craft. That is to say, uh, the art, intuition, talent, uh, sudden inspiration is one thing, and I think it's necessary. Uh, but at the same time, there are techniques. And when I switched from Russian into French, and started uh, writing in French and translating into French, uh, I had to pay the price. And the price is Russian. I cannot translate into Russian, which is my uh, uh, first language, mother tongue, uh, that I still practice all the time. But the technique is not there. So if I can uh, compare, I would say that translating into French, uh, where I have the technique, I'm like a, like a chess speller. That is to say that I consider only a couple of variants of possible moves that I see immediately, uh, not caring about all the rest. And when I try to translate into Russian or into Swedish, into English, I'm like a computer. Well, a computer is very fast, but extremely stupid. So the computer, uh, go through all the 10,000 possible uh, variant. So perhaps at, uh, in the end, one comes to something, but it takes an enormous time. It's not a pleasure at all, so that I cannot translate into Russian any longer. What about your Ukrainian? It's a, is it a family Ukrainian? It's family Ukrainian. Family? Yeah, well, yeah, from my parents and my grandparents. I, I call it kitchen Ukrainian because I basically have the level of Ukrainian that like a first grader would have, a, a small child. I can, I can get around the kitchen perfectly, but like to have a hot sort of lyric philosophical conversation in Ukrainian would not be possible for me. But I passively can understand a lot. Um, but I'm sort of at that level of language where I, it's difficult to produce, but I have some of that passive recognition. Um, but uh, what, how did you react when you came to Ukraine to Kiev and everybody around you was speaking Ukrainian? What was your feeling? Um, it was very interesting because I had, I had heard it so much as a small child that there were sort of routes, I think, in my brain that I already understood. Like the car had already driven on a particular road 
So it was in some sense felt like very natural. You know, I was, I, there was a kind of feeling of home in a way, even though it was, even though I didn't understand a lot that was happening around me. Um, there was like a lot of formative memories that were tied in with that language. I used to spend a, every summer with my, my babushka, my Ukrainian grandmother, um, and she would speak almost exclusively to me in Ukrainian and I would answer her in English. Um, uh, yeah, I so I was, once I was there in Kiev, you know, it was like hearing some of my earliest memories again. It was sort of being cued in my brain. Um, and of course, when I was there too, then I studied the language and I progressed a lot, but I haven't been, I haven't spent serious time there since 2014. Um, I've only gone for short trips, so I've lost a lot too. I, I, and I think I could get it back, but I don't have it right now, you know? But, but why did you decide to go there? Because where came the interest? Was it because of the family roots and so on, or because of what was happening there? Because history was on move then. Um, it was a coincidence that I happened to be there during a historical moment. Um, so I had spent the year 2011, 2012 in Minsk in Belarus, and I was teaching English there. Um, and then I spent the following academic year in Tbilisi in the Republic of Georgia, and I was working for an educational nonprofit there. And then I was deciding what am I going to do the year after? Um, and I had heard about this university in Western Ukraine that liked to hire foreigners and had like a really wonderful community. Um, so I applied and got accepted and I thought, okay, great. I will go to the land of my grandmother and my grandfather and, you know, learn about, um, learn about my family. And then of course, I had only been there three months when, you know, the protests began. Um, and so, I mean, the year was different than I ever could have imagined, I guess, too. But so it was not the right way to, to Ukraine. It was a kind of this round uh, round trip, exactly, uh, with uh, with a Georgian uh, intermezzo. Exactly. Yes. Have you have you spent time back in Moscow? Do you go back regularly? Uh, I do go back regularly because I still have family there, uh, but. Uh, uh, Quite seldom because if I go somewhere, I go to the north, uh, the northern Europe because of the work and all the collaboration and plan I have in Sweden, Danish, uh, Denmark, and so on. But uh, since uh, since I'm following uh, things there, since uh, I'm following literature, and I have many friends uh, in, uh, in Moscow still, uh, so uh, so I do go there. But it's it's always complicated with papers and visa and, and uh, everything. Uh, so it's I still have a feeling that it's a far away, that it's much easier to go anywhere in this planet than to go to Russia, and especially now. Yeah. What it what is the like what is the news from Russia these days? What are what are your friends and family on the ground saying? How how are they coping with what's happening? Uh, they used to ask me questions about what's happening in Russia, and that that's a very old oh. pattern. Because uh, after all the Soviet years and uh, the Putin years, people simply don't uh, trust whatever they uh, hear. So even a quite a, a good and sensitive, uh, sensitive information, they don't trust. So they ask, should one really wear a mask? And so if you say yes, then it, they s uh, feel somehow secure. And um, so uh, not everybody can do things like, uh, uh, ask friends in France uh, whether this or that thing is bad. That is to say that people are extremely nervous, hysterical. Uh, they don't know what's going on. So sometimes they exaggerate and think, some of them, uh, that everybody is contaminated. Uh, others think that all these are some intrigues from uh, the part of the government and one shouldn't care about it at all. 
and then nobody knows what the real statistics are. The only real uh, statistics that can be trusted is what doctors count themselves. Uh, uh, that is not, not uh, people that die, but doctors that die. So they count the colleagues. And if you have a, a number of uh, doctors that died from coronavirus, then you, you can mathematically extrapolate and uh, imagine what happened with the rest. Wow. So you have, in a sense, a kind of responsibility to translate the information you're getting for your relatives back in Russia. Um, and it's difficult because it, it's still everything's so new. I mean, I think it's hard to almost say anything with certainty, you know? It, maybe no. the feeling is different. Maybe this is just a symptom of Donald Trump's America, but... <laughs> yes, yes. I, I think that if I had been in your place, then I would be totally <laughs> horrified. But um, I do trust uh, that that was one of the main uh, uh, results and effects of my moving from Russia to, to the West is that I do trust the police, I do trust the authorities, and uh, not that I think that I, they are particularly smart, not always, but I think that they try to do the best in most cases, which one unfortunately cannot say about you, uh, the U.S. today. today. Yeah, yeah, I, I, Personally, do I have great faith in the press in the U.S. I mean, I think that I think translators and journalists are like all as <laughs> superheroes to me. Um, but unfortunately, like I do, I, I don't think American people can or should trust their local police forces, which are you know heavily heavily militarized and. Um, yeah so so yeah the it's 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 a it's such a strange moment honestly to be having this conversation with you right now yes and uh, then there is another thing which makes uh, the situation in the united states uh, uh comparable with russian and with european that is to say the the um, internet and social media which most people get the information from and this is a real disaster because uh, because that's completely out of control and i think that uh, well, russia and uh, the united states and well, perhaps latin america and uh, uh, countries that are most suffering from this because uh, people imagine all si uh, kinds of absolutely unimaginable things yeah have you have you noticed any infiltration of, you know, fake news or whatever in the French context or in French social media? Do, does Russia seem to be, or even nefarious American uh, interests? Like, are they targeting French conversation in a way, or are you spared oh, I, from that? Well, I'm not an expert on uh, uh, French uh, social media because I hardly use any. I try not to use any, but uh, mm -hmm. as uh, uh, you, I trust press and um, try to avoid to see because uh, every every time you look at the social media, uh, they, they, they are terrified and despaired. But in Russia, it's still worse because um, uh, there is a myth saying that Russians are talented uh, for the learning languages. This is uh, a myth that has nothing to do with reality, which means that very few Russians really can follow uh, English speaking media. And the only thing they have is either their own media or the governmental uh, channels, which are just lying all the time. Yeah. Uh, that's the problem because in American, uh, European, uh, Frenchmen can still switch from one source of information into the other and uh, if he doesn't trust the French, he can look at what Canada says. Yes, sleeping again, a lazy <laughs> thing. Uh oh. <laughs> so I think that that's, uh, do, do you have any information from Ukraine? Um, in terms of like coronavirus specifically? Yes. Yes, yeah, specifically. 
You know, um, my friends that I've spoken with there have said that for the most part, it seems like it's being taken pretty seriously. Um, although a lot of the restrictions are now being lifted and restaurants are opening up again. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I, my friends are also very concerned, of course, because the medical facilities have no capacity to really deal with, yeah. with a, spi a, a serious spike. Um, so at least my, my, my friends in, uh, in Kiev and Lviv mostly, um, they're being very, very careful still. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, so it's such a, such a sad situation and, and the infiltration of fake news has just exacerbated it. Too. Well, what do they say, uh, and what do you think of the political situation uh, in general after Zelensky uh, came to power? What uh, do people think? What do you think? I mean, I think I'm I'm pretty cynical, I guess, but the because Zelensky still has so many oligarch ties and hasn't really been implementing the reforms that people want him to. But I guess one thing that he has done in a way that seems important is simply he has said and put forward language of transparency. You know, he even if it's just lip service, he at least talks about values that I agree with. And in that in that way, it's like he's sort of made it possible to imagine and demand those things, right? When he doesn't live up to them, the people can can say, we need to hold you accountable. Whereas I'm contrasting this to the US where we don't expect anything of our president and there, he, because he, he says, he doesn't say democratic things. He doesn't care, he doesn't say, you know, he doesn't have the language that uh, we can hold him accountable for. You know, he says, <laughs> He says all of the evil things and then does the evil things, you know. So we don't even have, we don't even have have that, and and it makes us very complacent. Whereas I think in, it seems at least to me, of course, and I haven't been. The last time I was in Ukraine was 2018, so um, so it, I haven't been there recently. But it seems that at, at the very least, he has put forward a projection of of what could be possible, even if he's not going to be able to achieve it. Does, does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Uh, did you hear uh, his uh, uh, New Year speech, greetings? I don't did think I, did. I don't remember if I did. What did he say? Um, uh, I think about it because the Russian uh, intellectuals were very exciting. They did this, uh, very simple things. They compared Putin's address to the nation with Zelensky. Well, was Putin was, uh, uh, I don't need to describe what Putin was like in his speech, talking all the time about the glorious Russian history, as usual. Zelensky was moving freely on a kind of a podium, uh, talking, so, so it was a pre-registered show. He was speaking and they were projecting things. And there was a, uh, uh, a living person who was speaking, whereas with Putin, one had a, a really an impression to to look and hear in the, in the automat. And uh, I think so. In in this way, so I don't follow the um, Ukrainian politics um, closely, but I think that somebody who can think and feel and talk about future because that was he, he was doing. He was saying that uh, we are very different. That was the main point. We are all very different. And then they showed all kinds of different people uh, in the streets and so on. But we have some common values and they are. And so and we have to make them stronger. So it was, uh, it was usual and not usual talk just because uh, I think that was the first time after many centuries that the Ukrainians heard something like this. And, and I don't think we can underestimate how important that is, even if it is just language, you know, even if he's not going to be able to deliver all of those promises, 
he has by by you know like by talking about it we can begin to imagine it you know i think that's so important um i and actually what when you were talking about that it reminds me of something that i noticed in the fall lat just fall 2019 which was that um during our uh donald trump was you know being an investigated and going through an impeachment hearing um he was very upset about uh the former ambassador to ukraine oh, yes. um and one thing that i know i noticed when he was talking on fox news he said um that she didn't hang my portrait in the embassy in kiev she refused to hang it she's like a terrible person because she didn't hang up my portrait and i remember <laughs> hearing that and thinking oh this reminds me exactly of the opposite of something Zelensky said in his inaugural address, which was taken from his television show. So, and he said, do not hang portraits of me in your office, hang portraits of your children there. And before you make a decision, look them in the eye. And I just remember thinking, wow, like these are the exact opposite values being displayed. And, and again, I think I'm a bit cynical because he, he, that's a line from his television show, The Servant of the People, right? So, so he sort of, but, but he, but someone at some point imagined that and understood that it was a powerful idea and he was reusing it in his actual inaugural speech. And the contrast between that and the words coming out of Trump's mouth were just, to, I mean, to me, it sort of said everything that one needed to know about the impeachment trial in the first place. You know, yeah. there's like, there's, there's like a, some, some earnestness there, you know? Yeah, I see. And then also one can also think that Zelensky is uh, as a good president as one could have in Ukraine in this historical schedule because miracles do not happen uh, often. Uh, in Czechoslovakia, it happened with uh, Harlem. Yeah right as a president but it happens almost never happens so so Zelensky is on his place and let's hope only that uh, that something will go on in this country when uh, when are you going there back again i don't know i mean we were hoping to go this summer, but obviously that's not happening now. So mm -hmm. maybe maybe next summer. My my husband is a musician and he has a, the chance to do a European tour usually every summer. So we have we have often tacked on a trip to Ukraine at the beginning or the end of that. So I, I hope we can do it next year. But have you been have you been to Kiev before? Oh yes, my my grandfather was uh, grandmother was from Kiev, so. Uh, uh, and uh, she left it uh, during the war when the Germans were coming. So she walked with my mother, uh, who must have been something like eight uh, years old, and uh, her cousin. So they walked all the way from Kiev to uh, some place uh, in uh, Ural Mountains, because uh, their parents uh, from Moscow we are evacuated there with uh, part of the Russian industry. So, so in, sorry, instead of uh, going from Kiev to Moscow, which is already a bit of uh, distance, uh, they had to walk uh, further on, uh, almost to Siberia. Uh, but then my so my mother's no my, not my grandmother what i'm talking about my uh, great grand great grandmother was from kiev and she returned back to it and mm -hmm. lived there uh, till till she, she was dead did you meet but her oh, have you met your great grandma yeah. Oh. Yes, they are all extremely long living. So she died something like 130 and my grandmother 100, uh, not, not 130, 103. So, yeah. uh, it's only the Caucasian people that live up to 130. But uh, 100 was she and my grandfather as well. So I, I quite remember her. And, but I don't remember my own stays in Kiev because I was too little then. 
but I went there a couple of times um, when I was getting bigger. What, what year did you officially emigrate? It wasn't called emigration officially because uh, uh, I married a Frenchman and it was in the uh, 1918s. So I had time to, to learn my Swedish in Moscow and to, well, my French was awful until I moved to France and thought, well, now I have to, have to forget English, which I, which I did actually. And um, so from that time on, and I, of course I come back to, uh, to Russia, to Moscow, but I seldom have a, the opportunity to, to travel uh, uh, within the Soviet Union, uh, Russia, uh, inside. Um, yeah. How did you get interested in uh, the Scandinavian languages and literatures? Oh, that, that was also a, a kind of a political decision because uh, you know, the, the education in the Soviet Union uh, when it came to the languages was very good. I must, uh, it's one of the few things that were uh, really good. So, uh, so I started with English and um, then I um, saw what happened with uh, my fellow students because that was the time of uh, Soviet Union expansion in Africa. And I saw all my fellow students that were uh, from French sections that were taught uh, Portuguese very quickly and sent as uh, interpreters to uh, different African countries. And so they had to translate for Russian military and Russian engineers and so on. And I said, no, I don't want uh, uh, this. What should I do? Then I looked up at the map and I thought, oh, Scandinavia, that looks nice. <laughs> and uh, at, that, at that time, they are um, creating a, a Swedish group. So because in the English was uh, English, and German and French were languages taught at school in the college. And uh, these rare languages, small languages were taught only on the university level. And there was a little Swedish groups that I joined. And um, then I began to read and then I discovered wonderful uh, Scandinavian literature. And, uh, and so I feel myself on the safe side because I didn't think the Soviet Union would try to invade uh, Sweden in the coming years. And then Finland was there. Uh, and uh, I think that it's also doesn't matter which uh, which literature one is interesting in because uh, every every language uh, uh, how should I say every linguistic area is a world of its own with history with uh, future with literature and. Uh, if you know one of them, even a small one, then you have an idea of the world, lit world literature. All this uh, to, not to excuse me, but uh, I know there's no excuse, but to explain my total ignorance of uh, today's American literature. Aww. Well, that's okay. I'm actually very ignorant about any Scandinavian literature and I hope you'll have some recommendations for me. Um, but, but yeah, American literature, it's a, that's a big category. There's a lot to discuss there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in, English speaking literature in general and everything which is not uh, Russian or, uh, or Scandinavian, I simply do not have time because as a literary critics, I have to follow what happens there. And I simply do not have time so I'm, I'm sure I missed quite a lot, but. Um. Yeah, so do you, do you then consider studying history as part of the required work that you must do as a translator? Is that how you think of it? Oh yes, uh, surely. And that, that was one of the things that I appreciate with this uh, Russian or Soviet, because now it changed uh, method, educational methods because uh, it was a complex when you choose, for instance, uh, Swedish, then you have to 
uh, learn uh, old Icelandic because it's the mother of all Scandinavian languages, and then a history of the language and uh, history of the country and literature and uh, everything. So it all becomes a, a kind of a, a yes and complex building. Okay. And, and luckily enough, since I started with English, I couldn't start it directly with uh, uh, Scandinavian things. Uh, then I had uh, also this, that is to say, old English and, um, and uh, uh, Gothic language, of which we have only two small texts, uh, but still we, st we studied Gothic language in Moscow in the 18th century, absolutely unimaginable. Wow. It was an education that uh, didn't have any connection with real life. What would you do with somebody who could, uh, yes, uh, make, uh, write, or uh, <clears throat> draw uh, old Icelandic runic uh, wow. scriptures in uh, the country that was building socialist? So it was diff <laughs> difficult to imagine. But it gave, the, gave a kind of a basis that allowed them to to do other things. You went, you said you went to Moscow State University? Yes. Did you have good professors there? Uh, some of them, yes. And uh, I think that's very important. Uh, some of them because that, that's what is wrong with this uh, online education is that everything that this out uh, chemical things that happens when it, a teacher and a student uh, uh, interact uh, is uh, is not there, and uh, of course I mean I, uh, I remember some of my teachers which were extremely important for me, uh, but not in the field that I choose. Really. One of them was um, a historian, a medieval uh, historian, which, uh, which was extremely important for me at that time. Uh, another one was an English uh, gentleman that was allowed to come once a week to Moscow University and to speak English to those poor students who never could uh, hear a native speaker even if they sat there and said cat, bat, and uh, try to pronounce things to, uh, with um, what matches. So if you say poor, then your, the flame word should be extinguished. So all this we did, English dialects and uh, most crazy things, but we never met an, uh, an Englishman, a live Englishman. And that uh, man, would come and simply read English poetry and comment on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was great. Uh, oh, disappearing. <laughs> and his son, by the way, who grew up in Moscow, one of these very, very few, <laughs> very, very few, few um, uh, children that could grow up in, in Moscow uh, became a professor in Russian literature in the United States, uh, Richard Thompson. Oh, so, wow, uh, cool. Yes, from that time. So, and his father was, I was listening to his father and his music, English music. But he was extremely, extremely uh, cautious. He would never start any discussion with the students. And then we uh, we learned to know later on that he was he came first as a correspondent of uh, Morning Star or something like that. That's why he was allowed. But we tried not to think about it. We tried to think that here is the English poetry that is coming into the room. <laughs> Oh, wow. Do you remember yes. any of the poets that he read? Oh, he, he was very systematic. He, uh, he started with, uh, I believe he must have started with Shakespeare and then Chaucer and he went on to the Romantics. Don't remember any modern poetry, well, perhaps early 20th century poetry. But uh, that was all. But that was that were a precious moment because all our teachers were. Right. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. A dog? Yeah, sorry, it's really loud. There's someone like mowing a gra like mowing a lawn outside and my I have my dog in the back room and he hates noises like that. So, sorry for the commotion. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Like I said, I don't have an office here, so usually like I'm at the kitchen table and my husband is playing music on the couch and it's and the dog is barking. It's just like a cacophony of noise. <laughs> but well, what time is it now, by the way? Uh, it's about noon, about 12. Yes. Six what time is it there? Six o'clock. Yeah. Six o'clock. And what is the weather like? Um, it's mild. It's like a nice spring day today. It's a bit overcast, but like high 60s, I think. Uh, yes. That is to say Celsius. I don't know what it would be in Celsius. <laughs> it's, no. it's mild though, not hot. Yeah. What about there? It's hot now, but uh, it's perhaps the last day. It's about, well, that wouldn't say anything to you. It's about um, uh, 30 degrees Celsius, which is another funny thing because one of my classmates from Moscow school, uh, because in Moscow I went for several years and created for a special mathematical college for mathematically um, talented kids. I wasn't one of them, but uh, uh, many of these kids who were extremely talented mathematicians, but uh, also part of them were you know, from the Jewish family, Jews, and had no chance to continue their education at Moscow University where they all wanted to, to, to come in. So many of them immigrated and some of them uh, so a uh, great number of professors in mathematics in uh, all over the world are uh, coming from this famous Moscow school number two. And one of them is a, a good friend of mine and uh, who is in Florida now. And so he is all the time uh, between these two cultures. So when he announces um, uh, what uh, the weather is like in Florida, I say, translate, please, because now he, <laughs> he counts the wrong way. And that's also a question which, so these are the these cultural things that slowly come out of, uh, out of themselves, so to say. But people ask me, uh, uh, what in what language I dream mm. and I said it depends on the language and I don't think that it's an interesting issue but the question in what language do you count is really an important one uh, and yeah. I must say that I still count in Russian oh yeah because it's something you learned so early and so it's so it's such a it's such a formative pattern, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also something it's like grammar structures in the language that you acquire um, up to the age of 12, usually, because uh, the um, psycholinguists say that one can be bilingual uh, up to 12 years. Well, it can uh, plus or minus. Uh, a year or two, but not after that, because mm -hmm. then uh, the basic profound structures are no longer created. That's interesting. But I still uh, don't and uh, cannot cope 100% uh, with uh, French, not only French, articles. Russian doesn't have article. Yeah. Uh, like Ukrainian, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I still make mistakes, basically articles. Articles. I make mistake with, mistakes with the cases. To me, the cases are just so difficult to have grammatically correct. A lot of them I can feel because of that sort of formative language with my grandmother, but I know I make so many grammar mistakes all the time. No, no. Well, uh, Ukrainian and Russian are also not the easiest languages in the world. To read, um, do you write and read Ukrainian as well? Not really. I usually, um, I mean, I can, I can read like articles or sometimes 
you know, I sometimes try to read poetry, although I think a lot of it is lost on me. I'm a very, I'm really, I'm slow. I'm slow at reading. And I need a dictionary and have to, you know, do a lot of work. Yeah, to get through. But um, can I ask you a question about Sweden? No, please. <laughs> I'm curious because I think uh, Sweden always comes up in conversation among people in sort of the American left as sort of this like utopia country where everything works well and everybody feels respected, which I think is probably very naive, but I don't really know. I, I've never been there. I don't really have any contacts in Sweden. What is, what is your impression? Of well, Sweden is a small country and uh, the life in small countries is very difficult, uh, different from life in the, in the big countries and even French compared to Sweden is a big country. So many things that uh, work quite well there would never work uh, in other place. Iceland is a paradise in some ways because uh, the Iceland population is 300,000 people. So then you can uh, it's quite uh, organizable and uh, Sweden is a, a nice place to to live and uh, nature is beautiful uh, culture is okay in literature but there is also this kind of uh, conformity which uh, uh, which is sometimes quite frustrating to make a Swede to do something which is uh, not according to the rules, even if his life depends on it, is not always easy. So it can uh, can be a bit boring, but I think that uh, that there are so many things that are not boring that uh, one had to to deal with it. But it's not the same as France. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to. Uh, According to what is we supposed to do, we have to come to literature, and to and uh, reading and books and uh, and besides, I want to know it myself. Uh, how do you read and what do you read and to have principles and rules and habits. Have, oh yeah. Um, so I mean, I think the, when I was working on my book, you know, I. I've really immersed myself in a lot of Eastern European literature and history just for that context. So I think in some ways, my, my knowledge of American literature is also a bit, you know, uh, stunted because I've, I've spent so much time in kind of this other area. Um, so, so yeah, so I mean, I think a lot, of, a lot of things that I spend time with are more interdisciplinary, I guess you could say, thinking about, Eastern European history. I read a lot of, you know, the Polish poets and some contemporary Ukrainian writers, of course. Um, and I, for a while, was, you know, very sort of fascinated and almost obsessed with your um, Anna Politkovskaya and her reporting from Chechnya. I've read a lot of her books. Um, so that's, that's sort of, I guess you could say my habits is I've sort of stuck on an, an area of the world in terms of what I'm reading, mostly. Yes, so, so yeah, I concentrate on what do you think um, about the Nobel Prize or so Belarusian winner? Yeah, I, I really like her work. I think it's beautiful. Um, yes. It was really exciting. What do you think? I, I think it's, it's wonderful because it's, uh, it's literature, it's not journalism. And uh, there are some things that are extraordinary. Yeah. And I saw a film which was made uh, after her Chernobyl book, which was very, very good. Are you referring to the, the HBO miniseries Chernobyl? No, no, uh, a film, a classical film, which mm -hmm. I trying to find but uh, disappeared both the, both the title and the rest and it was the only text in the film were um, extracts from the book and all the rest were images mm. very well done so if uh, you try to, to find it yeah yes, I would I love to I would love to see that he's very uh, she's very good really she's wonderful yeah no I think you're you're exactly right about like 
her genre. Like she, to me that like, that's why I, I love nonfiction so much and why I write nonfiction because it's so beautiful what you can curate with, you know, real quotes, real events and trying to put that together in a literary way. To me, it's like such a fun challenge. And she, I think she does that in a, in a really interesting form. Yeah. Yeah, so. What about the Ukrainian writers? Can you recommend somebody? I mean, I really like uh, Serhiy Zhidan, who's a contemporary poet. Do you know his work? I heard the name, but I don't know his work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think he has some really, he has a really interesting vision. He's also like a punk rock musician on the side. And I mean, he's like, of course, he's very politically active. He was a protester. He got, you know, beaten up um, in the days just after my done by some whatever pro-Russian, you know, um, folks in, in Eastern Ukraine. So uh, yeah, he's a really, he's a really interesting character. I think his poetry is lovely. Um, trying to think who else. Oh, well, the, the poet that I did a little bit of translating of some of her work, just really just for fun. Um, her name is uh, Luba Yakumchuk. And she she lived in Eastern Ukraine um, in the Donbass and she had to flee in 2014 during the war. And she started writing this poetry about her home, which she was exiled from essentially. And she was putting it on Facebook. She was yeah. using social media to share this poetry. And um, I just found it really interesting the, the way that the idea of being apart from home, being exiled and also using a medium uh, like so sh like Facebook to to share that work with the people who were back home. Um, I, I think her there's some really beautiful images in her work. You can actually just look her up online and read a lot of her poetry oh, for free. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I really like her. But who are who are you reading? What are some of your favorites? Oh, um, I read uh, my, my reading is uh, how should I say, uh, uh, three kinds. So I read for, for my uh, writings and research, uh, like, like you, about, uh, about um, Eastern Europe. And uh, for me, it's now Northern Africa, uh, because I discovered a, um, a manuscript in a Swedish uh, a university library which described life in Northern Africa by the Swedish uh, diplomat from the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So, uh, so there's something I, I'm trying to, to understand about uh, all this politics at that time and uh, what happened what happened in North Africa. So that's one thing. Another kind of type of reading is uh, uh, to literary criticism. That is to say, I'm writing, I'm reading what uh, comes out uh, of uh, Russian, by Russian and uh, Scandinavian authors in order to review it in Le Monde. And uh, very often to forget it immediately after having read and uh, sometimes to remember, but sometimes I, uh, sometimes uh, I discover things, uh, wonderful things, which I would never discover without it. And then I uh, reread a lot of classics because I think that uh, when you have to do with literary criticism, it's very important because it allows you to have a kind of model quality uh, level. And also because uh, I realized at some moment I, that all those books that I read as a child and liked so much and reread and uh, could almost by heart, that I read all of them in Russian. So I started rereading <laughs> classics in uh, English, Swedish, German, and so on. And it's so easy. You just download the complete works of Goethe and, and you're gone. And uh, sometimes it's just the same. Sometimes it's, uh, it's not as good as one thought. And sometimes one discovers quite a new book, something that yeah. never, was it one never managed to translate, like The Treasure Island. 
the treasure island we need, read in translation has nothing to do with uh, Stevenson. Interesting. So, so I'm trying uh, to read parallel things, but uh, I think that they would interrupt us soon. What is your next project? What are you going to work on? Have you? Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, to be totally honest, the last two and a half months, I've found it really difficult to, to write. So yeah. I'm, I'm mostly doing a lot of journaling. Um, just because it actually it feels so much of like the mood and the uncertainty and really the trauma that everyone's experiencing uh, feels reminds me of when I was in Ukraine in 2013-14 and Maidan happened and uh, during that time I also wasn't really writing but I was keeping I was taking notes you know and they ended up turning into a book later and I'm not sure if anything will come from this moment but uh, I'm I'm finding myself really just only able to just keep the bare minimum sort of notes about how I'm feeling, conversations, you know, political events. Um, I, and I'm also writing a little bit of poetry. I have been able to do that the last couple months, but nothing longer than, than, a, than a sonnet, really. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, what about you? What are you working on? Well, I'm still in the uh, North Africa with this uh, uh, because this manuscript, there are three of them in fact, that I discovered. So I uh, will publish the, uh, edit the text, uh, in the Swedish text uh, in, in Sweden with the Swedish publisher. And uh, I'm writing a book about uh, everything, the, the discovery and uh, uh, the, the book and what happens mm -hmm. and what was really amazing was that I, at the same time I discovered a, a, a Danish uh, musician who was there as a diplomat at the same time who describes in his letters home in the 1816 the epitome of uh, plug in Algeria in the northern Africa and it was so I found this text exactly when the epidemic broke out and there were these parallels between what I was discovering by reading and what I was discovering by, by experiencing life and uh, uh, not being able to uh, to go anywhere, not being able to travel and so on and so forth. So, uh, so in fact it was good for writing as well but even if uh, Yes, even if I wonder what's going to be. Wow, that's so, that is so interesting. Um, I'd actually, the last book I read was a novel, an American novel uh, called, uh, called Severance, and it's by a Chinese American author named Ling Ma. And it was, it came out in 2018, and it's all about uh, a respiratory pandemic. Um, and I, I've, I, I read it and I mean, it was very heavy to read, I guess right now, but the parallels and the insight, I guess, from it and having the fact that it was written several years ago was, was just fascinating, right? To watch what's going on in my daily life, to read that book and having them be in conversation with each other was, um, it was really a powerful experience. Uh, but well, Did you see they sent us a message that we have, have to- We can say goodbye. I know. Uh, they, yes, do we have to say goodbye? And uh, it was too short, I, I find. But it, anyway, uh, so good luck for everything you do. And um, thank you. You too. I can't wait to I can't wait to read uh, your book. Do you have uh, a publication date in sight, or an end date for the project, or a title for the project? Something that I could find. Some way that I could find it. Yes, but we, we can ask to uh, and keep a contact, couldn't we? That would be great. I would love that. Yeah, and I didn't even get a chance to ask you more about like translation theory as well. So maybe we can yes. have that conversation over email. Well, we have to have another uh, not blind date. Yeah, yeah, that would be really nice. It yes. was really a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Yes, same for me. So goodbye. You too. Bye. Good luck. <laughs>